Parsifal is one of the legends that I most often refer to, and I've given a lot of thought as to why. First of all, the two best explorers of this myth, in my opinion, are Joseph Campbell and the Jungian writer Robert Johnson. It's really worthwhile finding their analysis and pondering them. So why is this myth so compelling? I think it has to do with what the Buddhists call beginner's mind. Parsifal, as a holy fool, has that approach to life, and this is what is needed to save the kingdom. As Suzuki wrote, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, but in the experts there are few. Now, there are many variations and twists and turns in this legend, so I'm going to explore a more bare-bones version. So, young Parsifal is raised in a forest, far away from all others, by a mother who is governed by fear. She has lost her husband, a knight, to the Crusades, and is determined to not let this happen to her child. That sort of overprotection is not going to allow the child to grow, but it is one of the outcomes of the fear-ridden mother. She keeps the child from growing because she is too identified with them. Now all tales point to an inner experience as well as the one in the outer world and it is safe to say that all of us have that kind of fear encoded deep within. It keeps us from taking those chances we want to take in life and stepping up fully into the world. Well all is good until Parsifal enters adolescence and then he does what all adolescents do and steps outside of the bounded kingdom of the forest and into the larger world where he encounters some knights from the court of King Arthur. Well, the boy has never seen anything like this, but he is mesmerized and determines once he asks them who and what they are to become just like them. Many a budding rock star has begun his or her career this way, projecting onto their musical hero heroes their own potential, so it's not really a bad thing at all. But then he has to tell his mother, and upon hearing what he has to say, the poor woman faints. When she comes back and sees she will not be able to dissuade him, she lets him go, but not before insisting that he needs to wear the undershirt she has lovingly made for him. He agrees, of course, and what, you know where this is heading. A young man wearing his mother's homespun undershirt might not be ready to take the step into his own life so easily, but we will see. So Parsifal heads out to King Arthur's court, and when he arrives and the knights look at the skinny kid, they say, no way does he have the metal to make it as a knight. But Arthur is wiser than that. In the depictions we have of him, he sits in the center of the round table with all the knights around him. So we can be sure he represents the solar consciousness, the one that sees beyond what the little parts of the self are capable of seeing. King Arthur gives Parsifal a page and a sword, and off Parsifal goes, and of course the first thing he encounters is the Red Knight. Now the Red Knight is this ferocious knight who enters the court of King Arthur once a year and throws wine into Guinevere's face, and no one can stop him. He is the embodiment of martial rage, and is reflective of the kind of energy we must all conquer within, well, especially the young adolescent male, who may be carrying plenty of it. The Red Knight almost doesn't fight Parsifal, he doesn't really want to waste his time, but Parsifal insists, and the Red Knight unhorses him quickly, but Parsifal reaches for his sword and kills the Red Knight by piercing him through the left eye. Parsifal then begins to put on the Red Knight's armor, as was the tradition, only to be stopped by the horrified cry of his page, who tells him he should not be placing the armor over his mother's homemade undershirt, but Parsifal refuses to part with it and dons the armor over the shirt anyway. You can see the problem we have already. Along the way, Parsifal is also taught how to be a proper knight, which includes not asking unnecessary questions. Now one day he finds shelter in the Fisher King's castle. The Fisher King has a wound that will not heal. He is in agony but cannot die. His kingdom, reflecting the inner state of the king, or the ruling principle, is in dire straits as well. Nothing can grow or thrive. This is how we all feel when we are wounded. The people inside that castle and in that kingdom are enchanted. They know they are enchanted and know that this holy fool can fix them. Now the word enchantment is interesting. It can point to a situation where one is deluded or drugged up by some idea so that it is impossible to see the larger world out there. As Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. So Parsifal enters the castle and a ceremony begins where the Fisher King is paraded out, looking like he is close to death. Parsifal feels the urge to ask the question, but then remembers that he is not to ask any unnecessary questions and remains silent. 
the kingdom evaporates and he is thrown out where he realizes he has not achieved his heroic task because he followed the rules of society too closely. This tells you something about what needs to be done. Now, why is the Frisher King so wounded? There are many versions of this, but my favorite is the one where the Fisher King is wandering around in a forest as an adolescent with his hunting party, and he becomes separated from the group and ends up alone, cold and hungry in the forest. He smells some salmon roasting on an open fire, and he reaches for it and burns his mouth because it is so hot. Robert Johnson argues that this is what happens to you when you try to assimilate some knowledge that is too powerful for you. You're burned for life and never recover. In many ways, this does happen at adolescence. So what is the question that needs to be asked? Well, Parsifal has to roam around for many more years until midlife, until he can enter the castle again and get the opportunity to ask it. But by then he has found his own way and knows he must follow his heart and not the herd. And so he asks it. Well, what is it? Well, again, there are two versions and both are worth posing. One version has him asking the Fisher King, what ails you? And this points to what should be our highest value, compassion, concern for the other. The other question is, whom does the grail serve? And this one is compelling to me because it speaks to what we should be asking of ourselves all throughout our lives. What are we in service to? Is it to our family, to our community, our truth? As the theologian Paul Tillich once said, your God is your highest concern. And we should know what that is and perhaps enlarge our awareness from time to time to include that King Arthur largeness of vision. With beginner's mind or Parsifal mind, this is possible. It doesn't come without a price, of course. Parsifal must shed his mother's undershirt and walk his own path. But these are the things we all need to do to enlarge our vision.